we've taken to the road, we're on a mission to interview successful entrepreneurs. 90% of startups fail and we want to help change those stats. Our final stop on the road trip is our hometown of Dublin. We chat with co-founder of Buy Me, Devin Hughes, about how to take on corporates as a startup and how we got investment from Unilever. There's a lot of plucky startups watching this, right, that may have to come face to face with corporate giants at some stage, mm. which you've had experience in and handled it in, in a way that's, that's very different from what we've seen. So what was your experience with that corporate giant? So it's, it's actually, it's quite interesting because we've seen what corporate, we've seen the best and the worst mm. of corporate behavior in startup land. Okay. If that makes sense. So let me. I'll, we, we've heard a lot. So I'll, I'm, hoping yeah. to get, I'm hoping to get. Shot I'll give. I'll give it yeah. a bit of framing. I'll give it a bit of framing. So you know, we. You know, I started working on this concept in 2014. You know, I was on. I'd done four businesses prior to this. You know, four spectacular failures. I was getting the itch after about a year and a half, taking a break to do something different. I wanted to get out of what I was doing, get into tech. Yeah. Um, at that time, I kind of stumbled upon grocery e-commerce like okay. and my background is energy it's not grocery it's not tech mm. um, were the other four companies around energy no actually well some actually two of them were and two of them weren't okay um, i you know dabbled in a few different things but energy was where i spent most of my most of my career for that first 10 years okay um and i wanted to get out of energy it's heavily regulated it's incredibly difficult to build anything with massive capex i knew tech was going to be fast and cheap to do something impactful and scale mm. quick um, so I started looking around and I stumbled upon a commodity market that I'd never seen before, which was grocery e-commerce. And 2014, it was nine billion pounds spend, Ireland, UK alone. Wow. Losing That's three. a lot of money in it's Ireland. It's a lot, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a big transactional market yeah. and there's not many markets that big. And that's yeah. why I, I akin it to a commodity market. Mm. But it was losing 300 million pounds a year. That's the aggregate okay. loss of the entire market. So this was the losses of the, all the retailers combined. So it was a heavily subsidized market. Mm. So that's okay, it's not a big deal. But when you look at the long-term demand curve for online grocery, yeah. it was going to be 20 billion in Ireland, UK, in 10 years. Wow. And my, like, you know, final year... Opportunity. Yeah, yeah. Final, yeah, final year economist hat came out. It's like if you have a rapidly expanding market with heavily compounding losses, yeah. in a short space of time, you're going to experience a correction. There's going to be so, mm. a better mousetrap will emerge. The market just won't accept it. Um, so I just thought this is going to be one of the coolest places to be for a while. I, s I left the energy markets, I moved into technology, okay. I joined salesforce.com, that was the biggest platform technology company I could find. I just mm -hmm. wanted, to, I wanted to do a, a master's in platform technology. I, s I worked in Salesforce for a year to the week. Like joined in February 2015, left in February 2016. And that was your plan? That was just to learn? So I, we start, I started working by me end of 2014, left the energy markets uh, at the start of 2015. And over the course of my, my year in tech, I learned everything I could about platform, mm. about architecture, design, um, the, stor the story of technology and how yeah. can you convey that. You got um, a plan. Yeah, I, man, like, well, I, a this is plan. my fifth, remember, like, yeah. I, I, I ran head first into the other four. Okay. <laughs> I, like, this one I was going to methodical. My, like, <laughs> my, my, my fifth one was going to work. Yeah, my fifth, I was going to take the time to really, really, ta yeah. you know, really understand what I was doing here because, you know, it's a, starting a business is draining at the best of times but yeah. after you've gone through one it's you know you have to recover mentally and emotionally mm. and spiritually and financially yeah. um, and so I, I wanted to make sure that if I was going to take another dive that it was going to be well thought out well planned just just a simple yes or no had you raised money for the other four no uh, some small amounts but okay. nothing nothing I would say meaningful this is my first real venture back right, business okay. um, so yeah so spent a year building the business building the prototype um, raised a hundred thousand euros of pre-seed capital nice. right. and then we launched into the market in February 2016 um, and the goal was product market fit. That's all the first year was about. Um, and so I wanted to put two retailers on the platform. I wanted to see how a branded retailer and a discount retailer would perform in this new channel. Um, I went and met with some of the retailers. Um, I, you know, I don't think I was taken very seriously, if I'm honest. Okay. And in fairness, looking back, I don't necessarily blame them. Um, but one in particular, I met with, I showed, I had already kind of mapped about 60% of the products. Mm. Um, and you know, I was able to, I said, look, I'm going to launch this in February. You know, here's what your store would look like. Here's what it's going to be. You know, I'd love to partner with you guys. If you could give me the other 60% of your products, I'll be able to have a full basket. I'll share all the insights mm. and learnings. Like this is just pure knowledge share, pure innovation. Um, and I got a very polite F off. Very polite, you know, okay. nice Devin, sounds great. Keep doing what you're doing, out you go. Good boy. Yeah, yeah. which, okay. All I heard was keep doing what you're doing, you know? and. <laughs> that's what I did. Um, so February 
2016, I quit my job, I became the first grocery delivery person uh, for Buy Me. And um, you know, we hockey sticked. You know, we spent a lot of time lead generation, prepping for the launch. We really, like it wasn't by accident. Mm, yeah. We really, we really spent a lot of time. We surveyed 500, 500 people. At the end of every survey, we asked them to give us their email address, their phone number, um, so that we could pre-register them for the access to the app. A lot of people missed the lead gen in the first part. Okay. Um, and we wanted to very specifically create a hockey stick from the get-go. So we launched on the platform. Uh, five weeks in, I got a phone call from said retailer um, saying, look, hey, Devin, I know you were in my colleague before Christmas. Heard things are going really well for you. Um, would you be interested in coming for a chat? Great. Massive. Oh, mm. I literally jumped for joy in my living room after this call because the biggest milestone for me, this 12 months, yeah. product market fit with consumers and industry buy-in. Mm. I needed a large corporate stakeholder to validate the value we were bringing to the market. Okay. Um, and so we, I went in, I put together a deck, loads of deck, and a lot of people think that we're a delivery company, but we are a data science company. Mm. We don't own vans, we don't own warehouses. All we do is manage the cash flow and the data flow of the FMCG market. And we, that facilitates the delivery, that facilitates the connection of stakeholders. So I went in with a hell of a lot of data. Yeah. Um, you know, I was able to tell them uh, on-shelf availability percentages, the amount of time someone would go in and not be able to find a product, the time of day where certain categories were underperforming, where they needed new stores in the city. And this they, is all stuff they didn't know. This is, yeah, this is like, I mean, the way they would collect this data would be with clipboards and paper right. with okay. people standing uh, beside the trolleys. Yeah. So really, really manual. And this data is byproduct. Mm -hmm. It gets spit out the other end. That's the, it's the result of the transaction occurring. So <laughs> essentially, after about an hour of getting asked every question under the sun, um, I was told, well, look, Devin, really appreciate you sharing that with us. Um, we hadn't even thought of the data. But our legal team is actually super upset that you've been using our logo without our permission. So you're going to get a cease and desist letter in the morning. Thanks wow. for coming in. Killer. And uh, I know you, 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 you told us this briefly off camera, right? Can you, like, with the data, right? Could they not turn around and kind of go, look, I see where you're coming out with the data. This is super helpful. This is super for, for the business, for you and for us, right? And yeah, okay, the legal team aren't happy with this part. Let's sit down and talk. Mm. Th that was my first instinct. Like my, I, I set, we set Buy Me Up to be a solution for retail, for online. Yeah. Like a shared infrastructure that would allow them to be profitable online for the first time. Because they've spent the last 20 years burning cash, mm -hmm. uh, trying to win in this space. I didn't anticipate that we would be seen as a disruptor. Yeah. And yeah. this is not a, this is not a, uh, this speaks more to timing, how important timing is for a business. Uh, particularly a consumer business, I think, um, and also when you're in uh, more traditional markets. And mm. retail grocery is a, an old market. It, mm. Like the self-service supermarket business model is 106 years old. Like that's yeah. that's the, that's the last that, when that model appeared, and that's today we're still doing it the same way. Yeah. Um, Sorry, do, do, that person you were talking to, what was their position? Like I'm, I'm just trying to understand. Like, did, did they, did they, did, did they, they miss? They yeah, got, they did got, they miss they an opportunity here? Here's so here's where the big corporate. It's not the individuals. Okay. It's natural corporate behavior. Mm. We don't understand it. Yeah. We can't control it, and there isn't a stakeholder for this to sit with. Yeah. Shoot first, ask questions later. Just kill it. Got money and move to on. Behind just it kill it and move yeah. on. Yeah. And so what happened is we went into this automatic engagement where I was getting legal letters sent to me. And you can't not respond to a legal letter. Yeah. And it's bloody it expensive to respond. Yeah. I found myself five weeks, I spent five weeks trying to get to a commercial discussion and I found myself three to four grand in the hole. Four grand out of a hundred grand is a lot of money. Yeah, that that was our capital, that yeah. was our startup capital. Not a good use of shareholder funds. No. Yeah. Absolutely not. And so I found myself... You Scare, know, scaring shareholders a little bit as well? Not so much ex shareholders because it was friends, family, and you know it, it was people who were close to me. So I was able to manage that, but for sure scaring away seed investors. Yeah, like yeah. investors would not touch us with a barge pole. And the main reason being is that I'm trying to tell them that retailers one day are going to love this platform. They're going to mm -hmm. love this service, and it's going to add real value to the market. And they're looking at you know one of our potential partners trying to kill us. Yeah, we, yeah. We, what I would say is at this moment of time, in this at this part of this story. 99% of the people we've ever spoken to about a big corporate coming in to kill them is duck and dive and retreat or, you know, yeah. Yeah. different route. And, and totally understandable as well, because it is terrifying. Mm. Like, you've never been in this position before in most cases. Yeah. You don't know what those words mean. Yeah. Um, and you don't, scary yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. Like, I mean, at this stage, I'm six weeks after quitting my job. 
mm. and I'm delivering groceries for a living. Tech, like that's what I'm doing. Yeah, you know, yeah. I'm trying to build a technology company and trying to you know build something imp you know uh, impactful. But I'm I'm a man with a van mm. at this point, and having a billion euro mega company mm. coming at you he hot and heavy with mm. you know lawyers and stuff is incredibly intimidating. I, I just can't get over the whole uh, being invited in for a meeting and talking for an hour and then being hit with that at the end where, you know, like I, I know someone's probably gonna go, well, he's talking, I'm just gonna let him talk. Yeah, that's yeah. probably what it was. Uh, yeah, yeah, but, I think that, yeah, and I'm not, I'm not shy of talking either. So yeah. it could very well have been that case. Yeah, it's, it, it's, it's funny because they could have just sent a cease and assist. They didn't even yeah. have to have that meeting with yeah. you. So how did you respond? What was the next? Obviously four grand down out of a hundred grand. So at this point, like I'm, my, it's very easy to get caught up in uh, the big issue, which is, uh, you know, the, the industry is rejecting us, you know, and this, what does that mean for us existentially? But mm. what I would say is what we tried to really kind of refocus on was just thinking about the problem of today. Mm. And our yeah. problem today was that we didn't have a full basket. We didn't have all the products. So our, our retention KPIs were not where they needed to be. Mm. So I decided I'll just focus on the problem today. Uh, I went into one of those retail sites and myself and a couple of friends, we bought two and a half thousand, three thousand items. Yeah. And we brought one of everything off the, the shelf. In the one store? In the one store. <laughs> and yeah, we did it over two and a half, three weeks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, did it in blocks. It's a lot, right? Yeah, a lot of yeah, shopping yeah, baskets. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah so we, um, we did that uh, over the course of two weeks. We brought it back to my apartment, um, filled the bath with ice and water, put all the fresh fish and fresh chicken. I not want to go to waste. Um, and we built a, do a product tent out of a doggy house, like a little doggy tent. We put LED lights in it and we photographed. Uh, the 2,000, 2,500 products, 3,000 products, whatever it was. Um, and then we photoshopped every logo and every brand off every product because mm. at this point we wanted to prove something completely, completely different. One, well, the most important is product market fit. Yeah. Forget about all this other stuff, just the consumer, that stakeholder. Retail can catch up, yeah. but let's let the consumer drive this market let's let the consumer will prove the demand and then they'll have to and then they'll have to realize and catch up and, and everything exactly else. we can worry about the other stuff later and um, so we did that we kind of walked up to that legal line and we were good and um, but that didn't stop there i mean there was still quite a public spat there was complaints made to the advertising authority of ireland against us and um, calling our business misleading um, all sorts of stuff. From a particular brand or from? From, yeah, from okay. them. them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's, look, it's out there, you know, but, uh, and that was, that was an expensive process. It cost us 15 grand to go through that entire yeah. process and deal with that and have our lawyers involved in that process. Like, again, capital that could have been spent building our product or improving our customer well, experience. I was going to say, it's, it's money you haven't allocated. Uh, you exactly, know, like, yeah. Well, you have allocated, but not towards this. Not towards this, yeah, yeah exactly. So, um, but, the, and here's the other side of the coin, guys, because, I, 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 corporate has been, looking back now, yeah. all of that played a much bigger role because all that noise caught the attention of another corporate, which okay. was Unilever. Yeah. You know, and they recognized all of the trends that we, we had seen, and they knew that retail was in, was in a troubling position when it comes to online grocery for the long run. Yeah. Um, it's the fastest growing channel. The only other growing channels are discount and convenience. And so for a lot of retailers, this is a really tough position. So Unilever, you know, started working with us. We spent probably about 12 months just knowledge sharing. You know, I would go in, I'd meet their leadership team. We'd whiteboard the way the world yeah. worked. Because they understand data and they get it. Unilever is one of them, probably one of the most data aware businesses um, in the market. For sure, they're a leader and they, set, they really do set trends. But at that stage, they just had the right leadership team. You know, their leadership team was, was, was very cognitive of the challenges that there was happening in the market. Um, and then they came in and they really kind of got to know us. And they got yeah. to look at how, how the consumer was behaving. Um, what you, was the, because, you know, you, you met with them for a year. On the precinct that maybe they would take a stake eventually? Or, or was it just? No, it was just, I, 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 the approach that I've taken with this business, and uh, maybe, it's, maybe it's unique to us, I don't know, but... I try and meet as many people as possible from as many different stakeholder groups in the market because I feel that my job mm. as a founder um, is to collect as much market intelligence as possible mm. from all of the stakeholders in the market and then try and synthesize that into a meaningful understanding of what that is going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. And so meeting with these different stakeholders was just a part of my natural learning process of me trying to get to grips with this market, mm -hmm. especially when I have a retailer you know, coming at me really heavy and I'm like, well, why is are they, that? Are they looking at you as being a super expert on this as well? At that stage, um, 
so more than them probably. So it's spe- because it's specific. They thought we. I, I'll. They. They probably thought we were bigger than we were at the time. Okay. Which isn't a bad thing. You no, know, and I believe. So I take this approach. I call it the Wizard of Oz approach. Yeah. When you're building a business, it's so important to build trust. Not only with consumers, but potential partners and all the yeah. rest that goes with it. So. All they need to hear is the big booming voice. Mm. They don't need to know it's you behind the curtain. Yeah. Trying to pull yeah. the, the strings, With right? The yeah. Yeah. So like I would I would do things like I would set up a close our customer service thing, which was Zendesk that we used at the time, and I would have it feed direct to my mobile. So I would deliver groceries to a customer and let's say I broke an egg, which happens occasionally. Mm-hmm. Uh, by the time I got back to the car, I'd have the complaint, but I'd answer it as James from customer service. Gotcha. Yeah. You know, yeah. and then I'd, I'd then I'd be like, your shopper is going to be dispatched back to the store immediately. Yeah. I'd go back and get the eggs, and I'd arrive and be like, oh, you know, here you go, James from customer service said, uh, you know, your eggs were broken. I'm so sorry about this. And the customer experience was really powerful. Mm. You know, because they'd be like, wow, that was connected and fast yes. response and all the rest. So that's the Wizard of Oz. So Unilever probably thought we were a lot bigger at that stage than we really were. But of course, over the time of the relationship, mm. you start to get to know each other. You build that rapport. And you, they get to know exactly where the business is and what the position is at. How impactful is having a brand like Unilever on those pitch decks? Going into mm. big retailers and saying, well, Unilever have taken a stake because they see the bigger picture. Was, I mean, I can't, I can't stress it enough. We would not have raised a seed round had we not had the support of a business like Unilever. Wow. How much have you raised to date? Um, so we have raised... Three and a half million. Okay. And we're in the middle of another raise at the moment, which mm. we'll be announcing very soon. Right. Okay. Um, and if, yeah, for sure, we wouldn't have made it had, had that. I would say it was the purest form of corporate activism. Wow. In the sense that there was an opportunity to do something. They saw that the market needed a solution. Um, and even though other stakeholders in the market didn't quite get it yet, they did and they were going to support it. When they invested, it was like shooting a flare up into the market. And all of a sudden, we were able to have meaningful investor engagement. Okay. Okay. Um, and what's really interesting about it is that, you know, six months after that investment, Amazon bought Whole Foods. Yeah. And the whole world changed. Yeah. The, so uh, in, took attention. the entire grocery industry took a step back and a sharp inhale of breath. And I think a lot of people haven't really recognized, and this is a big part of, I suppose, what we've had to do as a business is to try and bring the macro visibility to the, to the story because mm. you can think about grocery and just oh it's boring old grocery and there's not much of an impact but when you think it's about, actually exciting well when you think about the market size yeah it's a 250 or ish billion market ireland uk alone <laughs> 250 billion yeah there's there's very People few markets eat. that size right <laughs> yeah eat. You know? who's the biggest player at the it's, moment yeah mm. it's tesco mm. tesco's yeah. the biggest player and this is the question i ask what's their market cap 19 billion, they're there about six, let's give it 20. Okay. The biggest player in a 250 billion euro market is worth 20 billion, and now they're going head to head in the only growth channel, the fastest growth channel in the industry with a trillion dollar yeah. company, yeah. four times the size of the entire market. Yeah, yeah. it's scary for, the, scary for them. Right? Yeah. yeah. So that's, that's where things start to get a bit weird because not only are grocery up against the likes of Amazon, mm. which, you know, have shown very clear intent into this into this market. Yeah. But also the brands, the FMCG brands, are investing a lot of money in advertising with uh, with Amazon yeah. because Amazon has amazing technology. That direct to consumer model is is is, is huge. Yeah. 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 It's it's really it's really strange. The retailers are housing their data on AWS, feeding Amazon. The brands are investing advertising money in Amazon, yeah. even though Amazon has the biggest private label strategy. Mm. They own sixty percent of the baby wipes market in the U.S. They own wow. they sell more batteries than Duracell. On wow. Amazon Essentials, I, I, I'm 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 conscious we're going to run out of time yeah, here. Sure. It, it, yeah, this, it, it's actually a super interesting story. Do you know, yeah, we could actually do a special on this. We should, we should we should actually do which we haven't done before, some sort of long form podcast. We need yeah. to come back and yeah, chat no, because sure. it's amazing. I get it. I get it. Yeah. But I suppose you know the answer to your question is that corporates are going to play a really important role in startups. Um, yes. We've seen both sides of the coin. They've they've made us. They've like and it's the biggest takeaway is you need to build trust. You need to build champions uh, at board level, you know, really to support uh, innovation. And, and that can only be done through open knowledge sharing. I think too many startups try and keep their cards too close to their chest yeah. in the early days. Had we done that, I don't think we would have made it to where we are today. So knowledge sharing is going to be a big part. If you're doing something that's dis- that feels disruptive and the market is being res- disrupt, is treating you like a disruptor, open up more. Hmm. 
because that's the only way you'll build trust is by yeah. opening up what you're actually trying to achieve for the market. Um, you know, and, and that worked for us because you know, after Amazon, you know, we were approached by the largest grocer in Europe and we became the first independent e-commerce platform in Europe to bring the discount channel officially online uh, through a partnership with Lidl. Wow. And so you look back and you think, oh, wow, that was a really difficult journey, but actually it all kind of built in, it all added up. And as long as you kind of react as best as you can to the, you know, what happens and try and mm. bear in mind that there's lots of different ways the cake can be cut. Yeah. yeah um, and just because one stakeholder wants you gone doesn't mean the market does. You yeah. just need to spend time trying to you know, find out where, where you fit and, and who your champions are going to be. Enjoyed the video? Like to see more? Subscribe below.